for uh, January 30th, uh, just gone, marked the 50th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. As we know, a march for civil rights in Northern Ireland took place in Derry that day. Uh, they were marching for basic civil rights and equality to be treated equally in a society where uh, the minority were seen as second-class citizens uh, by the government. The 1st Battalion of the British Army's Parachute Regiment opened fire on innocent uh, civilians, killing 13 people on the day. This followed the killing of other innocent victims uh, by the parachute regiment in Ballymurphy uh, the previous August. These events cast a long shadow over politics in Northern Ireland, and this is still evident uh, to the present day. The hostility established, uh, the, sorry, the hastily established Widgery inquiry found that the soldiers uh, uh, only started firing when they came under attack, uh, among other adverse uh, findings. This was deeply offensive to the families of those killed or injured, but it demonstrates just what the establishment in a so-called democratic state can do if so minded to arrive at a false and predetermined outcome. The barrister David Burke in his book published last year entitled Kitson's Irish War, a mastermind of the dirty war in Ireland, outlines how Bloody Sunday and other killings of innocent civilians in Northern Ireland by British soldiers were part of a ruthless dirty war uh, that commenced in 1970 uh, when Brigadier uh, Frank Kitson, a counter-insurgency veteran, was sent uh, to Northern Ireland. He further outlines how Kitson organised a clandestine war against nationalists and ignored a loyalist paramilitaries. How shocking is that? The families of those who were murdered have campaigned for justice ever since. Uh, they have three basic demands, uh, a rejection of the Widgery report, an official acknowledgement of the victim's innocence and prosecution of the soldiers involved uh, on the day. They campaigned tirelessly and have been successful in achieving two of their three objectives uh, to date. British Prime Minister Tony Blair established the Savile Inquiry in 1998. It totally exonerated the victims and placed the blame firmly uh, on the British Army. Uh, British Prime Minister uh, David Cameron issued a state apology and, uh, and expressed his deep sorrow for what happened. But as we all know, unfortunately, the prosecution of the soldiers has run into difficulty. The Public Prosecution Service in Northern Ireland announced in 2019 that only one soldier, Soldier F, would be, persecuted, would be prosecuted. But this was subsequently dropped and this matter is now uh, before the courts. Which brings me to the appalling and unilateral decision uh, by the British government to bring forward legislation to prohibit future prosecutions of military veterans and ex-paramilitaries for crimes related uh, to the Troubles, to impose a statute of limitations on Troubles-era prosecutions. This has been widely condemned, and rightly so. It has been condemned by the Taoiseach at the weekend uh, in Derry when he said that the soldiers involved should face prosecution, condemned by the political parties in Northern Ireland, by victims groups and their families, by several international human rights organisations, including the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights and United Nations Special Rapporteurs, by Michael Posner, US Assistant Secretary of State, by the Committee for Administration of Justice in Northern Ireland, and the list goes on. This move essentially overturns a crucial part of the 2014 Stormont House Agreement, which was actually agreed by the British and Irish governments and the political parties uh, in Northern Ireland. For example, there was a commitment given to establish an independent historical investigations unit as part of this agreement. In July last year, uh, talks were initiated between the parties in Northern Ireland and all the relevant stakeholders on dealing with the legacy of the past and on implementing the provisions of the Stormont House Agreement. These talks should be ongoing and the Irish government must continue to make known to the British government its total opposition uh, to these proposals. I would also like to raise an, another issue in this context. A range of rights-based uh, commitments in Northern Ireland have been made, starting with the Good Friday Agreement, right up to new decade, new approach. This is not happening uh, fully. 
For example, there has been a failure to progress a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland. These objectives uh, would give human rights protections to the people of Northern Ireland. In New Decade, New Approach, there was a commitment given to establish an ad hoc committee on a Bill of Rights in Stormont. This has run into difficulty. Various proposals in this area are being obstructed in the Executive and at the Assembly using different veto mechanisms. Uh, this is very regrettable. So what we all all this clearly indicates is that we need a full uh, implementation of all aspects of the Good Friday Agreement and subsequent agreements. All of us need to work at that. The British and Irish governments, the parties in Northern Ireland, ministers and parliamentarians in these islands uh, using uh, the bodies established under the Good Friday Agreement and civic society. We must rededicate ourselves to implementing all the provisions of the Good Friday Agreement.